so a few things we want to to go through but before doing any of that um let's open with prayer um looking at here uh laura would you be willing to open us in prayer sure i can do that the lord be with you also, also with, with you. you gracious god we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather for the opportunity to see each other's faces uh, for the opportunity to spend some time in your word. Thank you for this time of waiting and anticipation as we wait for your word to come to us again here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Laura. Um, so last time you had a pre-recorded video of me um, I didn't watch it because I don't especially enjoy watching myself talk. Um, I hope it worked. Uh, show of hands, how many were able to view it? Okay, but we'll just do a little bit of review from that because um, what we want to be doing is kind of comparing a little bit of what's going on in Matthew's version and what's going on in Luke's version. And um, one thing I mentioned in the video last time is uh, and, and what we'll see, and we might end up this discussion of Luke, if it takes more than this week and next week, and, you know, we go a little farther, that's fine. Um, a lot of people kind of get uncomfortable a little bit here um, when they discover what's in one story rather than another. Um, and if you looked at Matthew's uh, story in Matthew chapter two, one thing that's basically not in the story is Jesus's birth. Right? There's one verse that said, and they remained there until she bore a child. <laughs> I mean, that was it. There's no, it's before Jesus is born and then after Jesus is born. Um, it's the actual narrative, which means all of the things about, um, you know, uh, born in the manger or barnyard or however you translate that, the traveling from, um, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, you know, none of that is there in Matthew. It's just a different kind of discussion. Um, and we, uh, if, and, and I assume you can still go on to the, uh, if you go to the actual YouTube channel, you can find the one from last time to take a look at it if you like. Um, one thing I really kind of discussed was the way that what Matthew is up to in chapters one and two is paralleling Jesus with the story of Moses. And so a lot of even the phrases used, you know, the ones who are seeking his life are dead, um, are paired with what happened uh, to Moses or the, the uh, slaughter of the innocents. That is the, in Bethlehem, when Herod killed all the babies two years old and younger, the only other place where that thing shows up is when Moses is born. Um, so it, it's very deliberately trying to get you to think about that um, because, uh, and remember chapter one that we did talk about together in Matthew was about how there's a new turning point in Judaism. Something new is happening and it gets you back to thinking about what was going on with Moses, um, which then of course makes it the most surprising that several points in that story, even though it was so tied to Torah and to Moses, was inclusion about the Gentiles. The Magi, the people who come, who are the only ones who really get who Jesus is, and the only ones who really treat him as a king, um, is an outsider. The only other person to call Jesus king in the Gospel of Matthew is Pilate. Right? We have the outsiders understand who he is. So it's, there's this double move in Matthew where it's Jesus is very much the Jewish Messiah. But what I always, uh, my, I, when I used to teach Introduction to New Testament, my thesis for um, uh, the Gospel of Matthew was the Jewish Messiah for the Gentiles. <laughs> um, that is, the, he's the Jewish Messiah, but deliberately being sent and having a message for Gentiles. And that's what we saw in Matthew. We've been talking about the inclusion of others, of outsiders, 
in Matthew, that is all about Gentiles. How are the Gentiles going to be part of this story? Now, when we look at Luke, um, there's a little bit going on with the Gentiles there as well, but there's going to be a very different um, style of inclusion here. It's also very interested in inclusion, an inclusion of people usually not included in Second Temple Judaism, but it's from a different perspective, and that's what we'll look at. But the things we see, what happened in Matthew's version, what happened in Luke's version, are going to be really different. Um, and one of the things we do, we, we we just so naturally do it here um, as we move into, uh, and now we're in Advent, we're moving into Christmas, um, is we just naturally want to ask, well, what happened that day, right? <laughs> What's the story? Well, it, that is a reconstruction that we have to put together. Neither Matthew nor Luke gives all the day, uh, details. And so when we go and we try to put it together, we can sort of do that, but Matthew and Luke are both making very clear theological points. And we want to look at what are those theological points, try to get us there. And when we put it all together like that, we kind of miss all of that. Um, you know, for example, one thing in Matthew that's just simply not there is Jesus coming from humble origins or, you know, it just it, it doesn't have that. When they're in Bethlehem, it explicitly says that they're in a house, right? There's nothing about a manger there and so forth. Granted, it doesn't have that little timeline. But the, the, um, the point here we see, there's different things being said. And we're going to try to encourage you to think through that and what, um, what that means. So there's a lot happening with Matthew there. Um, real quick, any questions or observations on... on um, Matthew's uh, version. One, one question that has kind of persisted for me over the decade, it's literally decades. I actually did my only paper where I had to use Greek in my entire life was on foreigners in Matthew. Um, I promptly forgot all of my Greek as soon as the paper was done. So, uh, but my, the persistent question that I have is um, there's, there's two approaches to Matthew. One is that this is written by, is a very Jewish document. On one side, people often refer to it. I mean, the words that he uses, the language he uses, and that there is this outsider, non-Jew, non-Hebrew, non, you know, a much broader kind of category. And, and, and there's an intentionality about both of those pieces simultaneously. That seems a little weird. I mean, post-destruction post of the temple, it makes more sense. But it's, for me, there's, there's a tension in there between being the most Jewish of the, the pieces, and then on the other side, the most intentionally welcoming of the, of the Gentiles, the nations. Um, so if I don't know if you're going to address that as part of this or not. So, Well, um, I, it's good to bring up, because not really. Uh, but that is, you're absolutely right. This is what's going on in uh, Matthew. And it's one of those moments where we have to try to enter our minds into the first century a little bit and how controversial that was. You know, for us, uh, Jewish Christianity is such a tiny component of Christianity in the whole. Gentile Christianity is what most of us know and think about when we hear Christianity. Not so in the first century, right? Um, Paul's uh, letters, for example, in Galatia and Rome, Philippi, um, he has to argue really hard as to Gentiles should be allowed to be included um, without becoming Jewish first. Um, it, it wasn't obvious to people that that should be the case. You know, um, and Matthew, I think, is arguing just as hard for that. And he's trying, but see, this is what Matthew and Paul are doing. It's actually very similar, where 
they could have just said, well, something different is here. You know, being the people of Israel is irrelevant anymore. You know, um, that was then, this is now kind of thing. Neither of them do that. They say, no, no, God keeps his promises. You do need to be the people of God. But I'm going to show you that you can be the people of God and include the Gentiles. <laughs> A very difficult thing to do. You're saying, because, you know, you can't just choose to be Jewish, right? You can't just choose to be part of Israel. You have to be born into it. And they're both arguing that not only that, well, that is true, you know, it's called the scandal of particularity that God just chose this one people, right? That's true. But it's also true that those who weren't born into it are actually included. You just didn't know, right? And that's what um, I think Matthew is doing. It's, it's making a, a strong case for that all the way through. This is why in the genealogy, it included all these Gentiles, these Gentile women in there. It was to say, they've been here the whole time. You just weren't paying attention, right? And it's going to be this theme continually. And the evidence is going to be, look at all of these Gentiles who understand who Jesus is, <laughs> right? Look at this. If there was a question um, as to whether or not um, Gentiles can have a real relationship with Jesus, it's showing you throughout the story, yes, they can. And then, of course, at the very end, when Jesus gives his commission, it's to go to all the Gentiles, right? Um, it, it's the, uh, for those who didn't do a paper in the Greek, uh, the word nation and the word Gentile are the same. I think Laura talked about that several weeks ago um, in uh, when she did the thing on Matthew. Um, that is, so when Jesus says, go unto all the nations, baptizing them. It's the same as go unto all the Gentiles, baptizing them. Um, and I wish that it was translated as Gentiles. I understand why it's not, but it's uh, uh, the only thing that Matthew doesn't resolve is actually more the question that Paul had to address, specifically with his conflict with Peter and Antioch, was everybody agreed the Gentiles could be there, but do they have to get circumcised? Do they have to follow the food laws? Well, that Matthew doesn't quite address directly. Um, and that'll have to be uh, left to other, other figures to kind of address. Um, and and that, that's a whole conversation. But that's, that's what's going on in Matthew. So we've been talking about radical inclusion for Matthew. That's to go, uh, in many ways, the most driven into Jesus being the Jewish Messiah. And simultaneously, we're going to include Gentiles. And um, the other Gospels do have Jesus as Jewish Messiah, of course, but in a very different way. It doesn't double down on that nearly as much. Um, you know, uh, it, the titles of Jesus get confusing fast, but the, the, the rhetoric in... Um, in Luke, for example, we very much have Jesus as son of God. We, um, and we have, and then in John, it's almost a whole different thing, um, where Jesus is this, it's really emphasizing Jesus's divine nature, who is coming to the whole of the earth. And yeah, sure, we'll call him Christ, but that's almost not the point in John. So uh, it, that's a, a radical overstatement. But it, it's Matthew that really enters that and that really includes Gentiles. Both things are true at once. So I think that's a really critical um, point. Um, any, any other questions about what Matthew's story is doing or, or observations before we move forward? Okay. Let's look at Luke. And if any of you think through here, you're remembering back to Matthew, feel free to bring that up. Um, in Luke, we have a very different picture. Now, unfortunately, Luke 1 to 2 is long, so we can't just go through it all together. Like Luke 1 is 80 verses long. Um, but it, it's, so I just want to kind of bring up a few things before we jump forward to verse 26. But um, beginning in verse 5, we do have a birth narrative, but we actually have two 
birth narratives. <laughs> that is the narrative of the birth of John the baptizer and Jesus. And they're very directly parallel. Um, and this is going to be very important as we look through um, what's going on. So really quickly, um, the story of the birth of John um, from, uh, and it'll kind of go backward and forward, but beginning at uh, chapter one, verse five, and that goes until chapter, or excuse me, verse uh, 25. Um, we have, uh, it mentions just one brief thing it says here in verse five, a, a important point where it says the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah and his wife was a descendant of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. So the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, notice how much it's emphasizing that they were priests, right? The priesthood is not something, um, if you wanted to be a priest in Israel, you had to be born into it, right? It wasn't a matter of um, just going through your candidacy committee, right? There was, there was more requirements. And, uh, uh, and um, it really wants to emphasize that. Now, for those of you who know what's going on with John the baptizer, that's really critical because by this lineage, he should not have just been a priest, but a really special priest, like maybe someone who would have been the high priest. And um, what he's going to be doing, we won't talk about this with the birth narratives, but it's just too important not to discuss. What he does in when he is baptizing people, he's baptizing people for repentance and forgiveness for sins. Now, you might not know, in Judaism, that, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't novel to have repentance and remission of sin but it was usually done in the temple you'd go in the temple you'd make whatever the proper offering is for the um for the heirs conceived um and then you'd receive uh remission what john does is says i'm going to do all of that but you don't have to go to the temple I'm going to be out here in the Galilee and because, you know, the temple, only certain people could go into the temple and it was restrictive. And there was, you know, a different things It says, no, everybody can come. Everybody in the community can come be part of this. Right. Even people who don't like him very much can come be part of this. It, it's, it's a totally different understanding. And, and um, also where he is in the Galilee, it was basically impossible for most people to make it down to uh, Jerusalem, you know, three days walk. Well, you know, there was no, um, you know, we have the modern invention of the, the weekend, you know, uh, <laughs> you worked every day except for on Sabbath and on Sabbath you couldn't travel and it wasn't enough time to travel there anyway. Um, these people have been structurally cut off from religiosity. John with a priestly lineage says, oh, I can do all of that, but we're gonna do it right here. We're not going to do it down in Jerusalem. It's just a little aside, but really important for why it's emphasizing so much the priestly line of his parents. Um, uh, and then this thing is all tied into that because then uh, Zechariah goes into the temple, you know, as the priest, he goes into the temple and um, there he has an appearance of the angel Gabriel who comes and speaks to him. And then they have this narrative of, well, we're very old in age and we can't have children anymore. Well, you are going to have children. And then a little bit of an ironic thing where um, he's not so sure this can happen because they're so old. And then, um, and then Gabriel says, well, because you didn't uh, believe this, then you're going to go blind until, or excuse me, go deaf until, uh, uh, until the baby's born. There's a very clear parallel here which is the birth of Isaac, um, of this, uh, an angel coming, um, talking to them say, and saying, we're really old, we can't have children anymore, saying, no, no, you're going to have a child. I won't really explain how it's just going to happen. And then kind of a disbelief moment when um, we always call it Sarah's laughter. But by the way, Abraham laughs too. We just don't seem to remember that bit. But anyway, <laughs> that's, uh, 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 and, and there's this sort of, of remember that scene and then um and then we have uh uh here this um this little uh moment where uh in verse 14 
you're going to have this baby, you're going to name him John, and you'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his sight, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Um, and that's a really key uh, component, that in the, the sight of the Lord is kind of like the presence of the Lord, um, the role, which is usually the role for a priest, being in the presence of God in the temple. He's going to do that in his being everywhere he goes. That was a little, little aside, but that's uh, about as much. Any, any questions or thoughts about that first section? Yeah, I, I just laughed at the next line where it says he will not uh, partake of, of wine or what is there? I'm trying to find it here. Um, mm -hmm. Or strong drink. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Strong drink. Yeah, wine or strong drink. I thought, okay, how does that fit? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's pro what most people think. That's probably a Nazarite vow. That was something in the Old Testament. Most famously, Samson did that, where you weren't supposed to drink any, it was literally anything from grapes, which is usually wine, um, and then not cut your hair, um, and, oh. and so on. And people wonder, maybe that's what's going on um, uh -huh. um, here. But what's actually kind of interesting, if you look, if you look at the Old Testament precedents for this, the rhetoric and language you have of an angel appearing to give someone a very uh, a specific role usually is a prophetic calling. But what's, and, and, and it is making that claim, and it's going to be, you know, the power of Elijah in verse 17, the spirit and the power of Elijah. Well, it's usually prophetic calling. You know, that doesn't usually happen for your parents. <laughs> That happens for you, right? And so there's a little bit of a uh, <laughs> of a shift here um, in what's happening, and uh, and and we'll see that. Oh, I forget what verse it is, um, where it says, you know, that, that uh, even before even before they were born, there was this plan, um, and so this was this kind of this is a plan that's been derived but it's actually important in luke that there is all this connection in luke there is continuity and there's it, it's the story of luke is kind of the continuity of um this new christian message that is everything jesus does is in accordance with the law and the prophets then there's jesus which is in full agreement with them and then there is the uh uh Jerusalem apostles, the 12 apostles in full agreement with um, Jesus in the book of Acts, which is the second volume of Luke. And then there's Paul, someone who's not a um, Jerusalem apostle in full continuity with them. So it's like this sequence of continuity and the baptizers in there too. I missed it, but that, you know, it's always, there is an overarching plan and the providence of God is behind all of this and it's setting it all up kind of in order. Um, and it's kind of bigger than um, any one of the characters, including this, right? The prophetic call is, is already been set up, which, of course, we think that about all the prophetic calls. God had a plan the whole time. But usually, we don't learn about them <laughs> until you have the person being called, right? And here, um, it seems to happen uh, uh, before the child's conceived. Mm -hmm. um, so we have... Uh, a little bit of a different thing. It's a great, great little point. Um, any other thoughts or questions about this before we move forward? All right, let's jump forward to chapter one, verse 26. Do you have anything else about John? And, and we'll not forget John. We're going to do something I want to focus on here because we have to kind of pick a focus. But here we now have the story of Mary. It really is the story of Mary here. One thing that happened in Matthew's version, Mary didn't speak, right? She didn't have hardly any role, except she was just there. The angel appeared to Joseph in his dreams. Here, Joseph is barely going to be involved. He will be involved, but barely. Instead, this is the story of Mary, and Mary and Elizabeth, right? Zechariah's role is kind of done. Um, is Mary and Elizabeth is going to be included here. So let's start here. Um, chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. 
And he came to her and said, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Um, but she was much perplexed by his words. Uh, the word perplexed there is even stronger. It really means like lost, right? You know, confounded, you know, um, and, uh, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son and you'll name him Jesus. He will be great and be called son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born will be holy and he will be called son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of your Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from it. Let's pause there. That's quite a bit. Um, things that struck you here, and if you can think back, anything you see here that wasn't in Matthew or was but different, what, anything strike you about this piece? It, it, you know, one thing, usually when angels show up, um, the first words out of their mouth is, don't be afraid, you know, and where this is, Mary's not afraid, she's, she is really confused, you know, and, and that, you know, and I think that's a different response, and therefore, her response is a here I am statement, which is a very Old Testament, a very Old Testament thing that when someone is called and they respond appropriately, it is here, here I am. I, I, I'm, I'm physically here to respond to this. And, and that, you know, so we have that continuity, again, using your word, um, in terms of it's a very Old Testament way to respond to when God shows up whether it be angels or God, God's self. Um, but I think that to me is, is very different than Joseph's response or other people's response, Zachariah's response, or even Elizabeth's response, which we will get to, really comes not from Zachariah's witness, but when Mary shows up at her home and she's you know six or seven months along the way, um, that, that to me is an interesting dynamic through this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. One thing that's going to be really clear is what a uh, notice the focus is on Mary and Elizabeth, and the agency of Mary and Elizabeth is quite striking here. Um, that's going to be something, by the way, in all of Luke Acts, is that um, women are going to be featured. Uh, quite a bit, and it'll be far more equivalents, and they'll have real agency. That second, a lot of people talk about this, well, you look at all the, the kind of women showing up, um, but there's the other pieces that they often really have things they're doing. They're not just around, you know, and that's um, a really critical component already set up here in chapter one. Um, and uh, like, for example, in Matthew, we did have the women listed in the genealogy and you know and that leading toward mary but mary didn't do anything in matthew it wasn't leading there here this is mary's story she's really doing something and and elizabeth's too and there's sort of a debate about what mary does and what elizabeth does sometimes in the text but it's clear it's one of them right and that's uh, uh, i think a really critical component here um and one of the things that talking about really making the point of inclusion is that in Luke is that women are going to have a much larger role here than in almost any other book in the New Testament. Um, so that's a, that's a critical component. The other piece that you're absolutely right is that this is not a very usual way, one, that angels show up. The, way, the usual way is what we saw with Zechariah, right, in the temple, right, in a big powerful thing, right, that looks a lot like calling the Old Testament prophets. That's not what 
you know, uh, Mary has, you know, usually it's this theophany and it's shocking and people don't know what's going on. Here, notice the words, uh, it says, greetings, favored one. The angel makes it sound like this is a normal conversation, right? You know, we just start with a normal greeting. Um, and then it ends when they're in verse uh, 38, Pastor Mike, you're absolutely right. It says, here am I, right? The servant of the Lord. Well, that sounds like something that say Isaiah says, you know, that here am I, send me kind of thing. But it didn't happen the way it normally happens. It was something far more um, down to earth than that. And I think there's a reason for that. You know, um, for one thing, um, Mary, as a woman, couldn't go into the temple where it was. And also, she's not a priest, not from a priestly family. Um, so, you know, simultaneously, Jesus can't go into that part of the temple either. I mean, it's just, um, uh, it's a uh, completely different uh, space. Good. Other things that surprised you or maybe different than you noticed from Matthew? I this is kind of along the same line, but it, I've appreciated it and it stuck out to me again. And in particular this time that Mary is asking questions before she commits as well. This is not just, okay, I'm going to, I mean, she, she makes that here a my statement, but she's asking some, some questions to get to some details first. Um, and that's okay. Sometimes it feels like, and I'm not conjuring the specific references to mine at the moment, but sometimes it feels like we're not supposed to, but she's, um, you know, in other stories in Old New Testament, but here she's, yeah, she's information gathering um, before making an informed commitment. And um, yeah. Yeah. And you could even contrast it just with Zechariah right? Zechariah wasn't so sure, and he went deaf, right? That, yeah, <laughs> exactly. There, yeah. Here, she's confounded and confused, and and I think there's something about the honestness of that response. You know, she's like, I don't know what's going on here, <laughs> and then, and then the, and then Gabriel explains, you know, a bit more. Um, I think is a, is a good point. Um, yeah, other things that, that strike you about this? It, you know, it, I, I, the other piece that, that for me is interesting is that this is theologically positioning um, the whole rest of the Gospel of Luke in terms of um, the, the way Beatitudes are okay. defined, the way that who Jesus shows up to, you know, um, I mean, there's a whole, I mean, the whole gospel is basically, in a sense, what they're doing in this prologue is, is telling you, guess what, God's going to show up with people that you don't expect. And that chain, and it's kind of like for the reader, the reader is supposed to be shocked at saying, what, you know, this young virgin girl is supposed to be you know, the mother of God, you know, the son, the son of God. And, and, and therefore, it, it kind of, it doesn't even hint at it. It's so, it's like a hammer, you know, saying, this is how, this is who Jesus shows up for. You know, and it's not just foreigners, it's for the poor, it's for the hungry, it's for the lame. It's, it takes Mark's healing stuff of all these dis disenfranchised people and just says, this is God's, God has a preference for these people. And I think that cha that changes the whole rest of the gospel. Luke's point is not about proving a, 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 Jew a Jewish thing. It's to prove who, who does God, who is God's preference in this, in this pattern. So. Yeah, absolutely. Terry, you also had a thought. Uh, yeah, sort of back to Laura's point, and it seems like there's a process of discernment that Mary's going through. It's pretty quick, but, you know, from the greeting, and she's shocked or perplexed or confused or lost, and then the angel tells her more, and then she asks a question. It's a pretty pointed question. You know, how can this be? You know, I'm, what, me? Who, me? You know? And then the angel talks some more, 
uh, and then she says, uh, here I am. So it's not a, like quick, like, okay, whatever you say immediately. And I think that foreshadows, you know, the word pondering is in there too, that Mary pondered this and she ponders it at the birth too. So this whole meditation and discernment that is Mary's, but also the readers or ours, you know, the, that it takes some time sometimes for uh, us to come to here I am. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And in um, the book of Luke and, and book of Acts, you see that throughout. The Holy Spirit is always the one driving it, but it's progressive. You know, it's a, it's a, a steady kind of movement. There's always something new that in Acts chapter 9, something happens you could not have imagined back in chapter 7, right? It's always this, this movement kind of forward. Um, there's a few other things here to just point out, thinking about Matthew's version compared to here. One thing, you notice, uh, I didn't count it, but about four times it mentions that Mary is a virgin. You know, one thing that's not in there that was in Matthew's version was the prophecy that is uh, Isaiah 7, 14, this whole thing about the, you know, Matthew brings this up, but the point for Matthew is to show that this is Jewish Messiah based on this prophecy. The point for Luke is different. It is, how could this be? Oh, because nothing's impossible with God. It's about the providence of God that, um, that this is going to show up, God's going to appear to who you wouldn't expect, you know, as Pastor Mike's point, right, <laughs> to um, something completely different than, <laughs> than the reason that um, then Matthew gave. It's the same piece of data, but the, re the, the purpose is completely different. Some people have tried to argue, well, it's implied, you know, but I don't know. It brings it up so many times and doesn't make that connection. Right? It wouldn't have been hard to make that connection, but it, it doesn't do it. It's, a, it's kind of a different, a different point here, I think. Um, other thoughts here? Laura, look like you had a thought. Yeah, I just, I, and this somewhat ties into that, just that I, I, this always makes me think of that Mary Did You Know song, and with apologies to those who like it, because it's, I mean, it is really pretty, but yes, she knew, like, we've got it all lined out here, it's just stupid to imply otherwise, in that sense, and so, but but I, maybe that's a very Matthean song in a certain sense, because you do have Matthew's Mary just sort of like, oh, it happens to her and she's acted upon and then this all unfolds. But yeah, if you're going to listen to Luke, yeah, she knows and she's asking questions and it's kind of insulting to imply otherwise. So I don't know. It's I, like that. I like that a lot because I, one is I don't especially care for that song anyway. But the, um, but, the, uh, um, but the point is absolutely from the start. She knows what's going on, right? I mean, she's a little confused, but she's, you know, so I guess the, the time when she doesn't understand is from verse 26 to verse 30. But, you know, I mean, that's not exactly a, a deep about, of, um, and, and I think uh, Terry's point, the pondering, she's continually considering this. She's continually trying to see the implications of this, um, I think is the case. Another key thing about this that you'll notice really different from Matthew, the angel does say his name's going to be Jesus, one thing it doesn't mention anything about is Emmanuel, what Jesus means, any of that isn't really part of it. Just kind of an informational piece that his name's going to be Jesus, right? And, and it's based off of, well, and part of this, remember the parallel with John, John was also given a name at the time, um, uh, which has a little bit more of an etymology given there for why that's important. But it's... Uh, 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 the, the key is going to be really um, uh, different. But another key point about what this angel says in verse 32, it says, he will be great. He'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. And as of his kingdom, there'll be no end. It is making clear he's going to be Jewish Messiah. That's a real thing that's going to happen here. And that is what makes... Mary's response, which we may not get to today, but we'll get there, <laughs> almost the most surprising in the Magnificat. Um, uh, and um, because in the Magnificat, 
it's not about the things you expected Messiah to do <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, it's about a, a almost completely different um, set of things. Um, okay. Uh, before we go farther, there's a few other differences between Matthew and Luke. One is it specifically mentions there in Nazareth. Um, in Matthew, there not, has nothing to do with Math Nazareth until the very end when they go to Nazareth to, f to flee from uh, Archelaus. Um, but uh, we can think about that a little more when we get to this traveling motif. All right, um, we have a few minutes here, so let's move forward. Um, um, just look at verse 39 uh, to 44. So I'm going to read chapter Luke 1, 39 to 44. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Okay, let's just pause there. Uh, what strikes you about this little portion here? Well, it's a remarkable level of interpretation on the part of Elizabeth. I mean, I still remember the first time I felt Meredith leap. It was because Jeff tested the smoke detector. That was, I mean, completely, <laughs> I, she, she's drawing a lot on this, uh, which makes you wonder where she got it. Right, which I think verse 41, I think you're almost deliberate. Verse 41 is helpful there, right? It says, and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Um uh, to uh, 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 to kind of discern what's happening here. Um, it's uh, Ben. It, it it's a prophetic announcement, not about the future, but but the prof speaking of a truth about um, what God is accomplishing, what God has already accomplished by just the incarnation. You know, and 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 to me, that's. I mean, all of a sudden we have two women in the same passage when we add in the Magnificat proclaiming this extraordinary event of God's salvation. And, 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 they, and they don't know anything beyond it because it has to be the Holy Spirit that's responding in this moment. Yeah, yeah. No, and this is key. It's really key. This isn't Zechariah who figures this out. Right. It's this. And I think it's not just that it's when it's also the experiential nature of the Holy Spirit in real life here in Luke. It's not going to be a bunch of decrees and propositions. It's going to be something that's going to be learned on the fly through experience. And, you know, at very much the ground level. And that's kind of the whole focus. And that's why, to me, the Magnificat is so profound. Um, so let, let's just go there because I want to at least discuss that. So um, I'll read this um, uh, quickly, verse 45 uh, and following. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He's shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. That was hard to read without the piece I've memorized in my head, which is different, but it's a, a different translation. But um, there's really profound moments in the Magnificat. We read, I mean, mo most of us know it liturgically, so on. And I think sometimes we forget its significance, especially where it shows up. And um, as uh, Pastor Mike just said, this is a prophetic effort, utterance. It's telling us what's going on here and what's the role of what's going on here really key what do you guys see there in those uh looks like nine verses well 
Well, in some sense, I preach on this in a couple of weeks. So without giving away the store or whatever, I, I mean, it, it, it's very assertive. This isn't speculation. This is, I mean, these are assertive statements. Yeah, and you know, a really key point in Luke, and also all the Gospels, because of the way a Gospel works, is it's going to simply um, exposit. Here is the reality of this, and I'm going to show how it plays itself out. I'm not going to provide a bunch of logical propositions <laughs> to prove why this is the case, right? Um, for that, you have to look to Paul, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, sort of, but um, that that is definitely the case. I mean, that's what to call it prophetic utterance is right. You know, in the Old Testament, what prophets said things, they didn't prove that. It's like, no, that thus says the Lord. You know, this is just, <laughs> this is just the case. Um, a really key point, though, is the shift from what Mary was told, right? Mary's confused. She wants to know. She's told this is Jewish Messiah. That's what's going to be happening. And that her declaration basically has nothing to do with what they would have expected Jewish Messiah to be. It's really not. If you look at Zechariah's um, uh, little speech there at verse 68 and following, and we'll maybe do a little comparison at the beginning of next time with that, that's what you expect more from Messiah. Here, though, that's not, that's not what we have. It's all about caring for the poor and the, the lowly, um, the hungry, um, and it's, you know, uh, it says, my spirit rejoices and God for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. None of that had to do with Messiah, right? Messiah was supposed to be, remember where the Magi went? They said, let's go to the palace. That's where Messiah is, right? <laughs> if this is a king, then it's, you know, uh, and, it, and one thing about Israel um, in the Old Testament was, uh, theoretically, they were supposed to care for the poor, but it usually didn't really come down to the administration of justice in the kingdom very much politically. It was like a religious obligation that, you know, it's kind of, you know, and, and they get lampooned for it many times, but that's the, um, the, the situation we have here. Here, that's exactly where Mary goes. It's not something we would have predicted. It's not something that was really revealed from um, the angel. It has to do with Mary's experience of it, it gets that who is it God is coming to? Who is it that's happening? What does it mean that Messiah is not coming from family of Herod or you know aristocracy, but to absolutely humble origins? And and real briefly. Jesus is absolutely from humble origins. I know everybody makes a big deal that Joseph is a carpenter. You have to think in the first century, that was not a compliment. That was not a skilled laborer. That was someone who didn't own land and had to be unskilled labor for hoping someone would hire them. And the, uh, the advanced skill, uh, the carpentry, it really is like builder with a lot of, you know, making blocks. Remember, that's what the uh, Egyptians made <laughs> made the Israel the Hebrews do in slavery. Um, this was not a good position, you know. Artisan crafts. The most frequent people doing that were slaves. In fact, it doesn't appear that Joseph is or Mary are slaves, but that um, that was usually was it. so. Jesus, is, what does it mean that Messiah is coming from that um, space? And that's really what Mary is reflecting on. Uh, any 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 thoughts here? Um, I have a few other things, but go for it. Another key moment here is it's not just saying, you know, we it is um, valuing the lowly. Everybody can say they value the lowly. A really key point is verse 51 and following. He has shown the strength of his arm and he's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. There is an inversion. You know, what does justice really look like? And justice is really key in Luke. Um, you know, for example, uh, in Mark, 
especially Mark, but you know, the centurion at the end says, truly, this is the son of God. In the gospel of Mark, that's the only person who says that Jesus is the son of God. He's the only person who understands. The narrator has told us, the reader, but it's the only one, the centurion. Um, in Luke, he doesn't say that. He says, sir, he says, surely this man was, and then it, you can translate it multiple ways, but it means um, innocent or righteous, or frankly, he was just, right? Um, uh, and that's the, the language, justice is uh, a key component and no real justice happens unless it is community-wide, right? You, you, being nice to the lowly isn't the same as actually doing anything. Right? I mean, that's part of what's happening here. Is it up, upheaval? Of what's, and they, they had a, you know, in the first century, I mean, we talk about uh, economic inequality now. Comparatively, it's a different world. There was no such thing as a middle class um, in the first century. They had a, what do you say, truly um, uh, equal tax policy, meaning everyone paid the exact same amount, not the same percentage, the same amount, which means if you were really wealthy, well, it, you know, it was basically nothing. There was no redistribution whatsoever. You were just, um, and the only way people survived was through this patronage system where you had to um, make nice with rich people who take care of you. And it was, it was horrible. I mean, uh, this is why in some, you know, it, it's probably the case at least 90% of the Roman empire were at least functionally slaves. Whether they were officially slaves or not is almost a distinction without a difference. Um, and that's the world they live in. Well, how can you possibly talk about lifting up the lowly unless you can actually do something about that? And so we see this, and it's not only here in the New Testament, you know, um, a really critical component is, well, if you're gonna kind of put your, you know, money where your mouth is here, then it has to have both and, right? There has to be some way that that justice looks in real life. And this is that experiential component in Luke Acts. Where, where is Mary and where are, you know, where is um, the world she lives in? Um, any thoughts about this? Yeah, just maybe I'm talking too much, but it, the... The, rea the thing that I, I find interesting is that oftentimes when the kingdom is proclaimed um, in other places, in other sources, it's, it's God's intervention to lift up people. It's not redistributive in nature, or at least I'm trying to, I'm, I've been racking my brains about that all of this is redistributive justice, which terrifies the 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 upper class i mean it's it's a direct challenge not to the evils of society but direct challenge of saying you who have wealth it's going to be taken away from you and given to these people because they need it and you have too much and and i don't know any other place where i hear of redistributive justice now in acts um, two and a couple other places that it talks about, you know, everybody's going to be equal in the system and we're all going to contribute, you know, basically uh, communitarianism, communism, socialism, whatever you want to talk about. And very quickly that changes by chapter six. But, but what I'm saying is that this is, for me, this is a really unique moment where uh, God's justice is not just fixing what's wrong, it's, it's fixing the whole system. So, yeah, just, yeah, I think that's right. The other for me, place that's, that, that's pretty interesting. The, the, the place you might think about, uh, Pastor Mike, in uh, James 1, you get a lot of this rhetoric as well. Um, it's different because it's aphorisms, but it, it, I think there's, there's something there. Um, but, but you're right. Um, and, uh, uh, and there is, this kind of thing. I mean, this is, and once again, well, Mary is saying things that were not what expected of Messiah, 
it's not unheard of, right? If you look at something like Amos or something like that, caring for the poor was a really important piece. And critics of, you know, say like a Jeremiah, of critics saying, you go into the temple and you offer all your sacrifices and then just go ignore all the poor and the, the, the marginalized. Um, you could see that here, but to this level of, uh, of this idea of uh, redistributive justice is important. And it's also important in Luke. Luke has it, you, you mentioned, Pastor Mike, the concept of kingdom. Now, we haven't, uh, I don't think we've come across the word kingdom here, but kingdom in Luke is different in that in Mark, the kingdom of God is something coming and we're waiting for. In Luke, there is something coming but it's also already within you, within the community, in the here and now, that we are to be the kingdom of God in the world. So rather than, you know, what we call that um, waiting, you know, it starts with there is evil and inequalities in the world. And in apocalyptic eschatology, we're waiting for God to come and solve it, right? <laughs> um, he's going he's gonna to come and destroy evil. In Luke, we might call it ethical eschatology. That is, yeah, there's evil in the world, but part of your role as being church is to be addressing that in the world right now, not to wait upon this coming in the future, um, which Lutherans like using the words now and not yet for that same, that, that same dynamic. But that's, I think, what's going on here, right? It's say, there's a real role for you right now. That's part of uplifting the lowly, you know, everybody's included. And that's going to be a really key component here is it's not just those people in the temple. It's not just those aristocracies and the, you know, um, uh, so forth, the people who can, you know, really do something or something. No, it's regular people here. You know, the, the, the people who usually don't get speaking parts, the people who are usually not in part. This is, this is what the Magnificat's saying. What does it mean that that's where the Messiah is coming from. And then the Messiah is going to do something that is very surprising. And a lot of it has to do with the source, origin, and the plan here. And that's part of the idea. Remember, again, the providence is a bigger plan than you could have imagined coming through here. Okay, we're just at about time. But uh, any final thoughts or um, questions about this? One just brief comment. This is why it's so important to read Luke as Luke and not mash it together with Mark or with Matthew. In Matthew's version, he is Jesus is being given wealth by aristocrats. By you know, it's all about happening in the temple or in the court of the king. Herod, I don't know if you missed it. You got how much he was involved here in. Uh, in verse five, in the days of King Herod of Judea, there you go. He's included. <laughs> I mean, there was, there, there is. It's just a different story altogether, and it's a different. And you only see that if you see what is Luke doing, and what's Matthew doing, and they're different things. And who is included really matters. So um, that's what we'll do. We'll take a little bit of time finishing up chapter one, and then. Um, look into chapter two. Uh, I kind of think we probably won't get through the whole thing next week, but we'll, we'll kind of uh, take the time we need because I think this is really important. And I want to encourage you as you're looking through this, um, you know, maybe now this week, if you have time, go read through Matthew one and two again. What do you see there now that you've been doing a little bit of comparison? And then Compare with Luke. What do you what do you see there? You know, these are brief enough. You can kind of go through them. And often that second reading is where we really see a lot of the depth there. So um, we'll start with that next time. Any observations you have? Okay. Um, Pastor Mike, do you have any announcements? And then could you uh, close us in prayer? Yeah. Um, no, just, just the normal ones. We are still, uh, if people are looking to get a Christmas picture, uh, the space is um, decorated, and so we just, we've had a couple people today. So, but probably by next week we'll be done with that. So please let us know. Um, let's see what else. Da, 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 da. No, 
Um, one thing that I'm playing with, and if people have feedback on this, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Um, we're thinking of uh, at least starting with an experiment in January, and I'm not sure which Sunday of the month it's going to be. It's maybe the second Sunday to actually do a Zoom worship, very simple, not a lot of production stuff, but a Zoom worship uh, on Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, where we could do some interaction around the text and have some more conversation uh, rather than me preaching a sermon. I do kind of a short introduction and then really kind of play with the questions, play with the text in some intentional ways. Um, we're just, I think that we're in need of seeing each other. And I think that, and so one of the things that we would do in that worship is to break into small groups and have a, a little bit more conversation with, within that small group about the text and then come back together and then share some insights. Try it a couple times, see, see if, it, if it plays, if it plays well or plays enough, uh, then what we would do is, uh, I don't know I'm if I'm ready to do two different worships every single uh, weekend, but we'll, I used to do three different services every week, or four actually, when I was at Trinity Gresham. But I'm an old guy now, so it's we'll see. But I think it's important to see each other. And I think this would be one more way. Um, ben, thank you for your service on this. It's been really fun and encouraging, and you're a blessing to this congregation, and thank you for that. And so, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Holy God, as your word is opened up for us, may our hearts and our lives be opened up to your Holy Spirit, so that we too like Mary and Elizabeth, be filled with your spirit and proclaim your promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Amen.